No, I didn't come from a musical family. Well, the only person who played it was my uncle. And in a way, I guess he was the one who kind of started me off because I used to listen to him play when I was a little boy, you know. Yeah. Play guitar? Mean, he played the mandolin and guitar. Right. He played, man yeah, he played everything, mandolin, guitar, and banjo. But mainly, mainly I would hear him play his mandolin. Yeah. You see? And uh, I remember, like, my first impressions were at family gatherings when he would break it out and start playing, you know? And I thought, man, what a nice thing to do, you know? What a, what a beautiful thing it is to hear music like that. So I guess I, I, I got bit by the music bug real early. And then I, I was, we were fortunate enough, I was fortunate enough that we had a record player with a lot of records. And when I finally discovered this record player and all these records, I started listening to like, uh, it was Django Reinhardt records. Yeah. It was like old Benny Goodman things and all the, all the jazz of the 30s and the 40s. And uh, then I think I started to start taking lessons when I was around 13 years old. But I was listening much earlier, like eight and nine. I was into all of that, you know. Yeah, so you could just kind of pick up, well, put the record player on and it come out flying more naturally probably than something. It did, and I was surprised at how much I had learned. Like later on when I finally learned how to play music, I realized that listening to those records when I was a kid helped me to establish like how chords move and how melodies are played. I mean just naturally, just from listening to it, yeah. you know. Sequences, patterns and whatnot. So basically I got interested because my uncle played the guitar played played the mandolin and guitar and stuff band drum and then I started listening because we had these records and in the next logical step was for me to start learning how to play and I like the guitar so I started playing that as you know, 13 years old. That's where I came into the picture. Yeah, I was, uh, but this this comes from, you know, I was I was born in Connecticut, that's near New York. Now this had a great deal to do with my early formative years because because I was so big to, <coughs> so close to a big city. You know, by the time I was 16 years old, and I started to be able to like drive a car and all. I used to go to New York City and listen to all these big time players like Sonny Rollins. And I even saw Charlie Parker play one time before he died. Uh, anybody who was hot during the bebop era, I used to go and see them play in New York. Yeah. I wasn't even really old enough, but I had like a fake ID and they used to, I guess they didn't know any better and they just let me in, whatever. But it was great because it gave me an incredible musical education. But don't forget back then there, in those days, in the 50s, early 50s, it was, it was just jazz. It wasn't a lot of rock and fusion. It was none of that really that was was in because it just hadn't gotten popular yet. It was mainly jazz. So all my formative years were was listening to jazz and playing jazz. So there was quite a bit of jazz going on at that time too. I mean, most of the clubs were jazz clubs. So the whole era and environment was so easy to, to come through because it was natural. Now, if it was this era, if I was born into this era, I'd be playing rock and roll or fusion or something, you see? I mean, you just gravitate towards what's happening now, I think. You know, how did that lead to becoming professional? Was it just kind of a well, it was natural? Just, yeah, it was. It was just natural because by the time I was 16 or 17, I started playing jobs and I started making money. And actually, by playing music, I could make much more money than like if I had a regular job. Because, uh, you know, I could go out and play weddings and things on the weekends and make more than some kid who was delivering grocery during the week. Right. So I saw this as being a good way to go. Plus, I saw where you could, uh, you just could make a decent living playing music. Of course, it hasn't always been that way. You know, I mean, it's been up and down, but... Uh, but you know, you, the music business was okay, I thought. I liked it, so I figured I'd go with it. Actually, I had no other interests. I didn't care about, you know, going to school much and all that. You know, they didn't thrill me. So I figured, let me just get out there and play. I enjoyed that the, the most. So basically, the style you first studied wasn't classical, it was just jazz. It was straight into... Yeah, it was, it was strictly jazz because that's all that was being played at the time, you see. It wasn't, it wasn't much, it, it wasn't top 40, so to speak. There wasn't rock and roll, there wasn't fusion, it was mainly jazz. Every, every time you heard like uh, contemporary music, it was jazz. Because way back then in the 50s, you know, you gotta remember, we're talking 30, 35 years ago. When you look back, like half of the people that play rock and fusion and everything are not even that age. 
you know, no electronics, it was just a straight guitar and an amplifier maybe. That, that's all it was, it wasn't anything, anything fancy. But could you, could you list the kind of events of the, well, the people you worked with, you know? Yeah, well, I came. When, I started, when I finally left Waterbury, and I, uh, my first real excursion away from home for a long period of time was, was uh, when I finally moved into, Ch into Chicago. I lived in Chicago during the 60s. Now that's when I really got some exposure to jazz, really got exposure to jazz. I mean, that was a big jazz town. So I played and recorded with Eddie Harris. I played and recorded with Sonny Stitt and Betty Green. There was uh, even a couple of sessions. I remember one time we went on a gig and we were back in Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, I played a couple. Of, I played a concert with Freddie Hubbard. I played with Stan Getz. I played with Stanley Turretin, Iris Sullivan, Wally Cirillo, Tony Castellano. These are people that. Um, some, you might know some of them, and some of them you might not know, but that doesn't take away from their greatness. I mean, they were just, they just are great players. And I played with all the players in, in the Chicago area. You know, that's about it, as far as I can remember. Oh, yeah, did the, uh, let's say, playing with, uh, with horn players, you know, saxophone players, did that change your outlook to the way you were playing the guitar? Or? Well, yeah, actually I should have been a saxophone player, I think, because that's the way I think about it. When I first, I never liked the way the guitar was played. I never liked, when I was growing up, I didn't care much, except only for a handful of players. I liked bebop. Yeah. I liked bebop very much, and there wasn't too many bebop guitar players. Of course, it was Tal Farlow, it was Chuck Wayne and Jimmy Rainey, and um, I think Jim Hall was just coming on the scene and all. But there wasn't so many people playing this instrument at all, line-wise. Mm -hmm. So I was constantly listening to Bird and, and, and Sonny Rollins and Kenny Durham and Oscar Peterson and people like that. And of course, that was all single line stuff. So my first attempts at playing music were, were not to play the guitar traditionally, but to try, try to play these lines, you see. That's what I thought that I wanted. That's the goal that I wanted to go after. So I just started playing, playing lines, as opposed to like playing chords and then breaking it up and whatnot. I, I was after the contemporary thing, but after the contemporary thing that the horn players and the piano players were doing. That's my approach to it, basically. It's only recently, in the last couple of years, that I began to think of the guitar as a game to guitar. Really. When did you start teaching? So I believe you started in, was it in Miami? About 10 years ago. Yeah. About 10 to 12 years ago, I started teaching in Miami, and I, started, I was teaching at the University of Miami. And I, I was on and off there for a couple of years. And then uh, I never thought much of it. I, met, I never thought much about teaching, let's put it about. I always figured, and I still consider myself a player before a teacher. And when I came out to California, of course, I ran into Howard Roberts and Pat Hicks, and they decided they were going to do a school, and we were all hanging out more or less together. So we, you know, we went, went, on, went on to it together. Uh, but that's, that's how I got into it. I got an interview. Um, yeah, I never, if you told me when I was starting out that I would be a teacher, I would have told you you were crazy, because it was something that did not appeal to me at all, you know. It's only the last couple of years or so that I really started to enjoy it. From helping students, you know, showing them things, does it help you yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, it helps you because anytime you, anytime you teach, you learn something. I mean, people present problems to you is what are amounts to, you know, and, and you have the choice to elaborate or just to, uh, you can just give the answer quickly or you can elaborate on it and start thinking about it and go deeper into it. I choose to think sometimes that, well, many times I've gotten deeper into it because someone's come in and sparked my imagination. I never would have thought about this particular area probably, but they brought it up. And since they brought it up, I started and decided to investigate it. And then, of course, you see common problems running, running uh, through a lot of students. And you, you try to solve those problems because you know you're going run to run into them all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so teaching has become a good, it's a good to teach. And it, it's taught me how to relate to a lot of people, too, at one time. Like, in this school, you know, we have to do seminars sometimes, 200 people, 300 people. And so I've been doing that for the last eight or nine years now, like, communicating with large groups large amounts of people and small amounts of all, so I'm really comfortable at this point in teaching. It's like, to me, it's, it's show business, you know, I get up there and it's just fun to do now. At one time, you know, when it wasn't, when it was 
brand new and I didn't know how to handle it as much. It was was a little bit of an effort, but now it's not hard at all. It's fun. Okay. It's entertaining. Yeah, can you name any students, you know, who got somewhere, gotten somewhere? Yeah, I can. I, I don't think that people would know them, but I have I have a friend by the name of Mark Fox that plays here. He's been playing for a long time. Uh, a friend by the name of Bob Phil that plays great. It was uh, uh, Steve Lynch is getting popular. He's, he took a lot of things that I did and, and went on to. Jennifer Batten took a lot of the stuff that I did and put it into two-hand playing, as did Steve Lynch. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's see. There's quite, a, there's quite a few students, but, you know, it's it's just hard to name so many of them. People would know them anyway, you know, because mm -hmm. they haven't gotten famous yet or made a big name for themselves, you know. So could you give some you know, details about your personal approach to the guitar, your own style, at this point? Yeah. Sure. The first thing that I always shot for was the continuity of uh, the way saxophones, trumpets, and piano players play. This is the thing that I saw no I noticed I noticeably saw missing in the guitar players at least way back when, you know. Except for the handful that I mentioned, you know. And there's probably more that I neglected, so forgive me whoever they are. But the idea was that because the instrument is kind of a bear technically it's, it's not so easy to get over. There's certain certain things you have to push through, certain technical things you have to push through to get to a point where you can execute these lines, you see? So my, my idea was to, pet, to push through that, to get to the place where I could play these long lines and, and keep the whole thing flowing, which I wasn't hearing much of as I was growing up. So that was my main approach at the beginning. The first approach was, was to take the bebop things try to uh, play them, just as any any young player would try to do, you know. Now after a while, this is a couple of years, this is a few, this is like 10 or 15 years on the road, I began to think that there's a lot more to just playing bebop because people like John Coltrane, as I was listening to all the horns always, John Coltrane and people like that were expanding the whole horizon of things. And I was also listening to a lot of Rabbi Shankar. So then, what I decided to do was try to play outside. Now I couldn't understand training in a lot of time, a lot, a lot of ways. I just couldn't understand, you know, how we got, how his approach was. I never had a chance to speak to him, so I didn't know exactly where he was coming from. So I decided to go my own way, and I discovered my own way of how to play outside, you know. But I, at at the time I was learning it, I didn't realize that I had a big asset in my back pocket, and that was my bebop experience. So I ke I constantly kept finding myself playing my outside stuff which is getting a little freer and stretching the tonalities, I finally find myself combining the two styles, you see. So now I can play like straight ahead bebop and then go outside for a while and then mix the two up, you know, so. And I think this is one of the secrets to making outside playing sound real nice, is the fact that you can play inside. You see? Yeah. So that's, that's, that's mainly what my approach is. And uh, I approach harmony the same way, trying to play the chord changes that are somewhat abstract, but then on the other hand, mixing them up with chord changes that are not, that are not so abstract. You see? We can't get away from that because we're just pushing forward. And it's, the more we push forward, the more things seem like they're abstract, they become melodic, so to speak. You know, I mean, we're in an era where everything is changing so much, including the music. It's just that I shouldn't say just like anything goes, but anything does go, if you know what I mean. Was the, uh, you're talking also, I think, about the book of uh, the, the Thoreau Oh, the, the book I studied out of yeah. on my own was uh, The Source of Melodic Scales and Patterns by Nicholas Leminski. But um, that's such a heavy duty book that, you know, you can only go so far, you can only take so much at a time and you have to put it down, you know, so I've been looking at it on and off for the last 10 years or so.